correct me if I'm wrong here, you're trying to build a religion, right? Exactly, yeah. I'm trying to build a company and a country and a religion and defy death and all of us become God. That's the goal. No time in history has someone been able to express an aspiration to become God. You now can, and it's not crazy. This next interview is with Brian Johnson. He started a movement called Don't Die, and he has a protocol called the Blueprint Protocol. Blueprint is a scientific expedition about the future of being human. He's all about just not dying and teaching people how you can live for a very long time, if not potentially forever, and we're gonna dive into that. What a lot of people don't know about Brian is that he actually founded a company called Braintree Venmo. He eventually sold that for $800 million, so he's a successful entrepreneur. And there's a lot of things we talk about here. We talk about putting Botox in your penis, right? <laughs> we talk about his, his sleep protocol, we talk about the efficacy of doing blood transfusions. What was the net result of that transfusion with your father and your son? For me, the results were. And so we'll get into that. And we talk about why making money is actually the most expensive thing you can do. It's a action-packed conversation. I hope we have more, but without further ado, here we go. So Brian, I mean, everyone knows you for don't die. And I know you for from Braintree Venmo fame. Um, but I have to ask you, what are some wild things you've been trying this year with your health last 12 months? I did my first gene therapy in October. Uh, it was full of statin. And so we've been looking at gene therapy for a couple of years. This was the first time we thought it would be safe. And so we did that. And I did uh, mesenchymal stem cells. We've been also wanting to do that for a couple of years. So yeah, we achieved two of the most advanced therapies just recently after a couple of years of doing the research. Got it. And explain to me like I'm 10 years old. Like what, what, bene what type of gene therapy are you doing? What kind of benefits were right. you expecting? Same with the stem cells. Yeah, so it's... So if the goal is to, to keep the body in good health, then there's a few things you can do. One... Is, is you can slow down your speed of aging. And so, for example, when you smoke two cigarettes, you lose 30 minutes of life. So that shortens life. You're wanting to do things that extends life. And so by slowing your speed of aging, you can press that lever. And so, for example, eating a healthy meal is better than eating an unhealthy meal. And then exercising is better than non-exercising. And you get all these trade-offs and you... Each one has a certain power of effect. Gene therapy and mesenchymal stem cells are some of the more powerful therapies. And so what we've tried to do is to say, of all the things you can do in life, how do you decide what power laws to focus on in order to get the maximal effect? Mm. And you have what you call the five power laws. What are those? Yeah, and I, I would say there's one more add sleep. So it's don't smoke, uh, six hours a week of exercise, a Mediterranean or blueprint-like diet, a BMI of 18.5 to 22.5, a little to no alcohol, and then prioritizing sleep. Got it. And what are you using? So I know for sleep, you've talked about measuring your resting heart rate is 47. I want to get into some of the metrics that you're looking at constantly, like your VO2 max. Like what are the core metrics that Brian Johnson like looks at I don't know, weekly, monthly, quarterly? We say on a monthly basis, we probably look at maybe a few hundred biomarkers. And then on an annual basis, you know, a couple thousand. Wow. And some are repeat. And so we do like daily, we're looking at like my, my body temp when I wake up, body weight, hydration, sleep stats, exercise, mm -hmm. and then we look at blood results on a certain interval. So we have these measurements at certain time points. But we like the when you get into health and wellness, there is an infinite number of things you can do to improve your health. And you've probably heard this in your own private conversations. Everyone's got a thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes it's cold plunge, sometimes it's their favorite food, yeah. sometimes it's some herb. Sometimes it's Eastern medicine, sometimes it's whatever. And it's hard to know what thing to do. 
And so what we did is we sorted all of the interventions we could by evidence and then prioritize it on a power law basis because mm -hmm. otherwise you're chasing Infinite. endlessly. Yeah. yeah. And then I know in social conversation, like when you're talking about this, everyone brings their thing to the conversation, which is the best thing because they've had experience with it or whatever the case may be. Mm. And then people start chasing those things and then they don't know how to measure it. And so it creates kind of a, a challenging space where you're not quite sure what to do, how to measure. And so you're in this continual cycle of trying, but not getting results necessarily because you're not playing with the power laws and you're not measuring. Got it. And what would you say your thing is? Pardon me? What would you say your thing is? I know high level, you know, umbrella level is don't die, right? But if you had to pick one thing, like for me, me I think my focus is more on sleep than anything, but what, what would you say it is for you? Yeah, it's a domino. Mm. If, you, if you get one thing right, and then the, it gives you power to do the next thing, it gives you power to do the next thing. And so everyone's got a different domino effect equation. Like mm -hmm. sometimes exercising enables you to feel good about eating well. And then eating well makes you feel well about going to bed on time. Sometimes though, it can have the inverse effect where if you exercise, then it's like, well, <laughs> I burn the calories. I can afford to eat the cookie. Right. So it's a tricky situation. The same is true when, when people take uh, supplements. It's like, I know I'm doing these good things for me. Therefore, mm -hmm. I can do these other things. So we, right. our minds are very quick to rationalize. Yeah. And that's why I try to create this, this comprehensive protocol of how do you approach health in the most uh, scientific way and be methodical about it. Got it. Yes, yeah, so I think we should, that's the blueprint, correct? Yes. So I think we should talk about that first because I have a bunch of questions that are tied to that. So what is blueprint for the blueprint for those that don't know? So the way to think about this is um, put it in context of historical explorers. So Magellan said, hey, can I sail around the world? And Watson and Crick said, can we deconstruct you know, DNA? So people have dared to aspire like peak imagination of their time and place. And so my imagination was in 2021, can we escape death? And to do that, that's where the project came alive. And so I thought, okay, to do that, you basically need to look at all the scientific evidence in existence, you need to rank it in terms of power laws, and then you need to apply it systematically and measure everything. It's the only way to go about doing it. Otherwise, you're in a qualitative world and you just can't build. Like right. science begins with counting. And so, yeah, three years in, I'm the most measured person in the world. And also, I have the best biomarkers, comprehensive biomarkers of anyone mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. And so if all the people working really hard to be healthy and do their thing, no one in the world posted better, better biomarkers across the board than me. Now, if they if they are great, like that's wonderful. I'm trying to set a standard to say if you're endeavoring to do these health and wellness things, it's best to have the biomarkers and the protocols available for analysis for everyone to benefit. Got it. And what are so? I remember you sharing some of your biomarkers at that summit that I saw you at. Um, and I think your VO2 what is your VO2 max right now? Yeah, fifty eight point seven. Okay, just for those that. I mean, VOT is one of the, the main measures of how healthy you are. And 50 is basically elite or close to Olympian level, I believe. And yeah, it's yeah. up there. Yeah. And so, and I think you said that your VO2 max is like the level of a 28-year-old or something? Uh, it's top 1.5% of 18-year-olds. Got it. And so VO2 max peaks at age 18, mm -hmm. and then it goes down from there. That's not to say that you can't get a high as right. you're older, but... Yeah, peaks at age 18. And I think the higher you are, the lower your all-cause mortality, right? Yeah, it's yeah. a good predictor of yeah, longevity. Got it. Okay, so what what goes into the blueprint right now? Because I, I think my my observation is you spent time building your audience for the last two years or so, and then just recently you started releasing products. I think the information you give away for free, can you walk us through how, I guess, maybe the business of that works? Yeah, this I started this as a scientific endeavor. It was... My, my contemplation was 
Well, it was the thought experiment I did. It was, uh, I imagined being present with the 25th century and I'm listening to them speak uh, in however they communicate. And they're observing us right now in the early 21st century. And so they're going to compress our entire century into three things. Even though our lives are rich and full and we have drama and love and mm -hmm. we have so much going on, 99 plus percent is going to be forgotten. And the 25th century will remember three things. And so I thought, what three things will they remember? And it seemed to me possible that they would say, that's when Homo sapiens figured out that death had previously been inevitable, but that as a species, they were wise enough to see, like piece these things together and say, death may no longer be inevitable. And we evolved from a die species to a don't die species, not just individually, but collectively. And so the, the don't die I, idea is not to die individually, but also not to kill each other, not to kill the planet, and to align artificial intelligence with don't die. That that's what you do when your baby steps away from super intelligence. And so I was basically trying to figure out like, what is the biggest thing happening on planet earth right now? And can I identify that? And that's when I came up with the, with the project. And so I wanted to basically be the embodiment of that thing. Mm, makes sense. And I guess we can go a little bit into the future here, but with AI, do you see us merging our consciousness with machines? And like, that's something I see potentially happening and maybe your physical body dies, but then you live on forever. How do you see it? Yeah. I think as a species, we would be a lot better off if we use the words, I don't know more often. Mm. You know, nobody knows what consciousness is. You know, like there's been feeble attempts at measuring it. We, we just, we don't know so much stuff. Like, is there a God? We don't know. <laughs> like no one knows. Mm. And yet in our space of not knowing, it doesn't prevent us from speaking and acting as though we know. But mm. if we really truly are sober about what we know, we don't know a lot more than we, actually, we, we don't know a lot more than we know. Yeah. You know, th there's a certain, uh, looking at some of your other interviews, um, you you take your time when it comes to answering and you take your time too when it comes to like saying you don't know, right? Where does that come from? Because I'm just looking around your room right now and you know, there's books on Napoleon, Churchill, Truman, right? Um, I think there's one on Roosevelt too. So, you know, what, what, there's one, one other person I think of that's very thoughtful, but for you, like, where does that come from, right? Because a lot of, especially entrepreneurs, we're very quick. We talk fast, right? We often don't think before we talk, but I think it's really important to be thoughtful about how you communicate. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering how you worked on it. it it's this embedded assumption that is so deep, we don't even realize it. It's that speaking is better than, the, the assumption is speaking is better than not speaking. Suggesting you know is better than not know, you know, admitting you don't know. Uh, filling the wor the air with words mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is, is like the better way to establish your standing and to create respect. And so it's just culturally built into us that we think that knowing and speaking is better than not, than not mm -hmm. knowing and not speaking. And I'm trying to, uh, I do this with myself all the time. I mean, I distrust everything. I distrust my mind. I just distrust others. I distrust institutions. I distrust history. Like, there's very few things I trust. Gravity is pretty reliable. Mm. You know, math is pretty sturdy. Yep. But outside of those things, I distrust everything. Mm. And justifiably so. Yep. Would you say strong views loosely held? Oh, but no. I would say um, lightly held views eager to be altered. Hmm. I like that.
quick message from the Agency Owners Association. So this is the peer group for agency owners that Neil and I both put together. This is for people that are doing six figures, seven figures, eight figures, even nine figures as well. And we're all here to help you grow your agency faster. In this group, we share leads. We also, we share learnings with each other. It's a community where people can ask questions, their most burning questions, personally, professionally. We'll share templates, reports, things like that. We're constantly adding more value to the group. I will tell you that the price is continuing to increase. The good news is that there's no long-term commitment. So you can just learn more by going to marketingschool.io slash agency. Once again, that's marketingschool.io slash agency to learn more. And we hope to see you inside. So I want to come back to the health stuff real quick. And then I'm going to jump around with, with business and marketing just because there's yeah. we can go in all different directions. But um, the the blood transfusion that you did with your father and your son did with you mm -hmm. um, is interesting because I was reading, you know, uh, a post by another kind of controversial, well, you're not controversial in my mind, but there's a controversial figure on Twitter um, that talked about blood transfusions with mice and how this this um, transfusions from a younger mouse to an older one led to reverse aging, led to um, you know, just better health overall, right? So is there anything you can speak to? I know at the event, um, it, it was hard for you to say if there's any results or anything, but have you found out anything else since then? Has what was the net result of that transfusion with your father and your son? For me, the results were none. But my father, he he had one liter of plasma taken out and then my liter of plasma put in. And it slowed his speed of aging by 25 years. Wow. So from a 71-year-old to a 46-year-old. And those results have persisted even six months post the uh, therapy got it and that's your biological age right so it's, yeah so I, and no, I, I actually no that's my chronological age got it got it um so you know people have talked about it's like okay people talk about oh you know so my age has gone back 20 years 30 years or whatever and then you have doctors that are like that doesn't really mean much doesn't what's mean your anything. pushback against that doesn't mean anything yeah the the epigenetic ages don't mean anything mm. <laughs> that they, they they are not good enough yet it's like cool to talk about kind of <laughs> yeah it's, it's um there's many more robust markers. And this is why I talk about my biomarkers is mm -hmm. if you get one interesting result on your epigenetic age, that's one thing, but you need to show like a hundred clinical biomarkers across the body and your cardiovascular ability, your VO2 max mm -hmm. and your total bone mineral density and yeah. your nighttime erections if you're a male. Yes. And you know, there's, there's like 20 or 30 markers that are relevant for whole body health. And mm -hmm. so it's uh, it. It's not persuasive to suggest that your a, your epigenetic age is a marker at all of right. whole body health. It's when you put the whole thing together and they all are agreed upon. They they mm -hmm. all agree with each other. That's Got when it. it's compelling. Got it. And do you have a list of these top twenty things on the blueprint? Yeah. Somewhere. Okay. So they could just go to is it blueprint dot com? Uh, protocol dot blueprint. Uh, protocol dot brian johnson dot com. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And you talked about uh, one thing I, I wanted to touch upon. So nighttime boners. Why are nighttime boners important? They are a bio. They are a biological age marker. As as a boy, as a male, you have a lot of nighttime erections when you're mm -hmm. a kid, and then over time they diminish. And by the time you're you know seventy, eighty, they're almost gone mm -hmm. entirely. And so it's a sign of aging and decline. And so it's a representation of psychological, cardiovascular, and sexual health. And it can be measured in terms of duration of erection and mm -hmm. also strength or quality of erection. Got it. And how many boners should people in their 30s, be getting nighttime erection should people be getting? Um, like, is there a number? <laughs> there is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when I measured mine for a... 45 year old the normal would be between three and five per night for a total duration of i think 120 minutes or so two mm. hours got it wow okay well that, that's every night yes got it and i'm assuming this is while you're sleeping too or yeah, that's right. So a lot, it, it happens, you know, these nighttime erections happen to most men. Yep. And you're oblivious to most of it because it's happening during your sleep stages. Got it. What what device are you using to measure this? 
Atom Health, a company out of the UK, they build a cube. It's about a centimeter squared. It goes on the base of the penis. And once you put it on, you kind of forget about it. Got it. Got it. And you mentioned also, similar to this, you talked about de-aging your penis too. So what have you done in that respect? Yeah, I did. So we were, so I chose the penis because it was understandable. Like we were doing this on my lungs and my heart and my thymus, which is responsible for my yeah. immune system. But when you do those things, people are like, yeah, don't really care. But you'll <laughs> so, get views for this one. So I was like, yeah, like, <laughs> okay, let me demonstrate the process of how, how this scientific method works on the penis. Mm. And so, yeah, we took all these baseline measurements. I, one day I was talking to the team. I was like, all right, like, what would it take for me to have the most quantified penis in the whole world? <laughs> like, what would we do? Like, what measurements do you do? Yeah. And so then we found every measurement we could do on the penis. We did them all. Mm -hmm. So we had a baseline measurement, and then we said, okay, now what things can you do to improve the penis? And we found two things. One, uh, two clinical studies that had the appropriate evidence. And so we did focused shockwave therapy, and then we had Botox. Mm. And those two, and then we did redid the measurements, and my nighttime erections went from average for a 46-year-old. Which is how many? Uh, like roughly, two, I think my, my, my measurement was like two... 132 minutes was my baseline. Okay. And then post therapies, it was 179. Wow. So it was better than the average 18 year old. Wow. So the, uh, yeah, the average 18 year old, I think, was around 145. Yeah. So far better than the average. And what is shockwave therapy? It's a, it's a technology that uses acoustics uh, um, to, it can be used on any joint of the body. A lot of people will use it when they're healing from like an ACL tear. Mm. So you, you use it in conjunction with the, the, the surgery mm -hmm. to accelerate healing, but it can be also be used on uh, the penis. So the clinical study we looked at was used for ED. Mm. And so we thought if it's used to restore penis function in ED, could it take a normal penis and could it enhance? Got it. Okay. The Botox, the Botox idea is insane. So, so, so by the way, I, I've, I don't really know how Botox works, right? But yeah. like, you know, you know, you, you know, a lot of people use it, right? It's it's to kind of stop the wrinkles, right? So like, how does it? How did you decide? How did you land on Botox for the penis? A study, yeah. Botox. A lot of people will they realize they know it's used for wrinkles, but it's also used for hair growth. Like it's used for so many things. I think there's something like dozens, if not a hundred, different applications for Botox. Mm. It's a widely used drug. Got it. I don't know that. That's fascinating. Okay, yeah. so so shockwave therapy, and you're doing that here, or do you have to go somewhere to do that? Yeah, a clinic that okay. has the specific technology. Got it. And Botox. I'm assuming you just go to like a someone like a nurse or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You. you went to a doctor that does Botox injections. Like you, you definitely don't want to get a vial of Botox. Yeah. Get a needle ready and like jam it into the penis. <laughs> no DIY. <laughs> like, it, like it needs to be like don't try this at home. <laughs> the injection needs to be uh, done with precision mm -hmm. and with the right technique. You definitely do not want to be doing this at home in the mirror. What are some of the things that you do that? Uh, and this might be a lot of things, but I'm just wondering if there's like maybe a small list of things that people should definitely not do at home. So the Botox piece, the shockwave therapy. Yeah. Because I know you have a lot of devices here too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Most, yeah, let me think. Most of the things I do by myself are measurement based. And then anything that is a therapy is usually from a medical professional. Some of the only things I do without a medical professional would be like red light therapy, mm. breathing, meditation, exercise. But yeah, we, we really do almost everything under medical guidance. Got it. And I'm sure you've gotten the question. So, I mean, I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you running a brain tree Venmo, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to quantify a lot of things, right? And I think yeah. it helps, certainly helps with quantifying yourself. Um, but then you have people that are like, oh, you know, um, what about just like living and, you know, um, not worrying about, not trying to quantify every little thing. I'm sure you've been asked this question a thousand times, but what, what is your response? Yeah. So it's actually really fun because. When someone encounters me, it's something like 95% likely they're going to say one of 10 things. And 
like no, none of us want to be predictable. Like we don't want to say things that everyone else says. We, mm-hmm. we want to be original uh, to some degree. And so seeing the predictability of how people respond to me has invited me to be even more self-aware that when I'm introduced to a new concept, to realize that the first 10 thoughts that come to my mind are going to be 95% predictable. And so I try to never say the predictable thing ever. And it really is like a good workout for the mind because the predictable thing is the lazy thing. It's the thing everyone knows. It's the thing everyone's going to say, and there's no value to it at all. Mm. And so, yeah, so living life is the first thing. But to be clever enough to realize what they're really saying is very hard. Like So when someone says, okay, he's spending all of his time trying not to die. He's not spending any of his time living. What are they really saying? Like, uh, they probably can't even unpack it. They're just assuming. So, I mean, what's your take? What are they saying? I think they're looking at you as a reflection of all the work that they're not willing to put in. And so it's an easy way out for them and they put it back on you. That's exactly. Yeah. That, and also like I was, I was teaching my son the other day, like how to think about any given statement. Um, Actually, I'll take a different path on this. Okay. So um, the person's assumption is that the uh, the objective of our time and place is to quote unquote live and that we should all be doing that mm-hmm. and that if a person doesn't do that they're somehow violating a social norm that people consider to be normal or sacred or appropriate or admirable like drinking not maybe not admirable for drinking but yeah. drinking yeah and so to put this in a in a sharp contrast Uh, time travel to 1870 and say, hey, you may want to pay attention to these new ideas about these microscopic objects called germs that cause infection. Now, I know this idea sounds nuts to you because you are not familiar with the concept of a microscopic world. You think you can see everything. Everything you care about, you can see. Mm -hmm. And that's how most people in the 1870s thought it. They thought even a lot of the scientists like that or doctors like that's nuts. <laughs> yeah. And so in the moment, what would be wise is for the person to say, okay, I see this person. He's not normal according to 2024 standards. He's not um, pursuing the objectives that people in 2024 do. Am I missing something in my viewpoint that I could, um, observe that would help me better understand the situation. Instead, they pull out the 2024 arsenal of status quo and they say, let me find every way he mismatches the status quo Mm -hmm. and I'm going to ding him on those things. But nobody wants to do that because you're going to be washed away in history. That's not interesting. Mm -hmm. You really want to find the interesting nugget of like, why is this thing unusual to my eyes? Right. It's, I mean, also like, there's a reason why most people are most people because they just aren't willing to put in the work, right? And so, but like, this, I guess this will go into Braintree Venmo a little bit. Have you always been this way where the way you guys handle marketing has always been you zig where other people are zagging? Because like, I just, you know, there, you have your picture over there with a the kettlebell, right? And I'm just like, <laughs> there, you, there's, you're, you're pretty smart about even targeting the penis, right? As a study, like, you know, that's going to go pretty viral, right? Um, and like, I think there's a joke about like, I guess you know, that for that week, I think people are just like, I, I guess it's time to inject Botox with my penis, right? Yeah. Um, did that come from Braintree Venmo or where did that come from? Yeah. Um, it, it came from this idea that, uh, again, uh, thought experiments are the way I can finesse my way around my own idiocy. Like, uh, by default, I'm an idiot. Hmm. And I have to try every second to not be an idiot. Why, why are we be t- by default idiots? Well, I said I. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. am by default an idiot. Yeah. And so every thought that comes to my mind is a category of idiot. For example, like my mind is repeating everything it knows 
about cultural norms in 2024, or my mind is generating a, a default biochemical thought that's not truly me, it's just a representation of my biochemical state. And so I have to fight through all my thoughts to then find the non-idiotic observation and then try to focus on that. Mm. And so with, with um, Braintree Venmo, I would say I was pretty trapped in the norms of being an entrepreneur and, and the way I could communicate with the world. Like for example, I, I felt uh, <clears throat> I could really was in a box and if I stepped outside that box, I would get punished so badly that I would like lose my status or power or ability to execute. And with Blueprint, I just decided that I was going to try to do something that would warrant the respect of the 25th century. Mm -hmm. And that meant uh, inherently that I didn't care what anyone in 2021 thinks of me. Mm. Like no one. Like I, I assumed every perspective of the of in of the 20, of 2021 mm -hmm. was idiotic relative to 2025 or 2500. Yeah. And so I just had to basically say I'm going to follow this path and play in a way that hopefully garners their respect. Got it. And ignore the noise. Yeah. 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 It is. Yep. Got it. Yeah, it's, it seems to be catching on. I mean, the, the the summit we're at, I mean, you know, everyone in that group does pretty well for themselves. Um, you know, what's interesting is when, remember, my car pulled up next to yours when you were leaving. So my my buddy, um, he's the one that's like, oh, you got to get him on the podcast, right? And so he had a question for you. Um, and this is going back to that the health stuff. And so, you know, you talk about, or not you talk about, but people that were at that event. So P Dr. Peter Tia, Dr. Mark Hyman, um, Dr. Stephen Gundry, all these people talk about how it's really important to eat meat and eat fish and get sunlight, right? Um, and so my buddy was wondering, you know, why, 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 what's the, what's the disconnect? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who shared their biomarkers at that conference? You. Only you. Yeah. But the... I understand the meat and the fish piece um, more so, but like, what the what's what's wrong with getting out, um, getting sun? Who shared their skin biomarkers? Nobody. I did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah. What 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 are your skin biomarkers? I must have missed that. Yeah, we use uh, multispectral imaging, mm -hmm. and we look as the sun is good for you, yeah. but too much sun causes accelerated skin aging and cancer. Got it. So, how much sun should we ideally be getting per day? It depends on time. Yeah. Well, yeah, it depends yeah. on so, uh, <laughs> yep skin type and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, this is what I do. So the UV index is you know something that is measured every day, like temperature. So I am in the sun when the UV index is below three. So either in the mornings up until like eight or nine a.m., yep. and then the evenings after like five or six p.m., yep. and then during the day when the UV index is higher, yep. I try to avoid the sun. Or if I'm in the sun, I'll have an umbrella, or you know, I'll wear sunscreen. Yep. That I do, I I do get sun exposure. I just avoid the UV. I mean, so I I as a kid, I was in the sun nonstop. Like mm -hmm. I grew up in Utah, we were at Lake Powell all the time. We just got baked. Yep. And I'm paying for it. And so skin gets damaged. And then you don't see the damage when you're young. But when you get older, you start it starts manifesting in wrinkles and in color, discolorization, like all kinds mm -hmm. of bad stuff. Yep. So I've been digging out of bad skin for a couple of years now. It's a lot of work. Got it. And I'm assuming you're you're cranking on the, the vitamin D every day. Yeah, I do 2,000 IU, which is enough to keep me at the right levels. Got it. That's fascinating. My, my practitioner, he has me taking 10,000 IUs a day. <laughs> Are you measured? <laughs> Yeah. Do, you, do you know yeah. what what's your level? Um, it was I just I don't remember the level, but I remember it was pretty. It was like red. It was pretty bad. So like pretty low. I see. Yeah. And since you've been on ten thousand IU, have you measured again? Yeah, we're we did measure again. It was going up, but it still wasn't at the level that we like. So we're going to measure again soon. So I, I I it seems like you get your blood drawn every month. I get my blood drawn like every three months or so. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So, so good job on measuring. Yeah, we'll see. I, I mean, I mean, you know, the reason I enjoy us. How, how many supplements do you take? For, how many pills are you eating for day? Uh, it's like 50 right now. Okay. So I, I eat like 31 a day. Yeah. And, but like, to me, it's like, well, why do you like doing all this stuff? Why don't you live? It's like, well, cause this is fun and it feels like it's, it's a game. Yeah. Like, sometimes you don't even know what helps, right? It's like, yeah. you're just constantly testing. It's like you're, you're AB testing your body. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, so, like back to your previous question, like why am I doing this now? Like yeah. um, when someone says like he spends all the time trying not to die, why shouldn't he live? I am, I believe we are on the cusp of what is potentially the most exciting existence in the galaxy. What do you mean well, by that? I should say the most exciting existence in this part of the universe <laughs> for us. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, but like, we don't know if other life exists. Mm-hmm. We've not been able to find it. As far as we know, we're the only form of intelligence in the observable part of the universe we can see. Mm-hmm. And we're giving birth to super intelligence, which has an ability to improve, you know, theoretically at rates far exceeding our own. Yeah. And so I'm wanting to trade off what I think is primitive joy now of you know, the debauchery of doing things versus mm-hmm. what could be this existence. Like, for example, okay, let me say this succinctly. The levels of ambition I think are possible. Like level one of ambition, start a company. Level two, start a country. Level three, start a religion. Level four, don't die. Level five, become God. Mm-hmm. You've n- no time in history has someone been able to express an aspiration to become God you now can, and it's not crazy. right? So yeah, I'd rather go down that path than I would uh, do the debauchery of some momentary pleasure and miss out on this amazing future. It sounds like a fun game to play. I mean, just looking at it as, as a game again. It's, I mean, religion to me, I think what a third of the people in the world are are Christians, right? So what is that like called two, three billion people? Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned this at the summit. It's like, yeah, you're trying to, correct me if I'm wrong here, you're trying to build a religion, right? And that seems like something that's that's worthwhile and that's something that can live on beyond you, right? Um, and that's going to take the rest of your life to do it. So, yeah. so why not? Exactly, yeah. Religion is the most durable form of human organization ever built. And religion does not need to be in the same format as it has been. It means there's a community of people who share a set of values and beliefs who work together towards a given objective. And yes, don't die, that we are at this moment. So the more of us that can band together, you know, with our evil designs of going to bed on time and <laughs> exercising, you know, and having good biomarkers, yeah. like, yeah. All right, quick note, this is about my company. It's called Single Grain, and Single Grain is an ad agency where we're focused on driving innovation. And so I want to talk about a couple of new strategies, and if you need help with marketing, great. If not, here are a couple of new strategies that you should try out. One is programmatic CRO. So we are doing programmatic conversion rate optimization on our site. We're building products that will automatically optimize your site to increase conversion rates. We're also auto-optimizing, auto-updating uh, from a, from an SEO standpoint, and we're constantly thinking about what else we can do in terms of enriching the visitors that are hitting your website, and also tailoring custom messages for them using AI. And so there's a handful of things that we're doing from a marketing standpoint, and our mission is just to drive more innovation. So if you want to learn more, just go to singlegrain.com, grain like rice. So singlegrain.com to learn more, and we'll see you inside. So what are you personally excited about with in terms of healthcare longevity for the next ten years, like? You know, I'm personally excited about the toilets that are going to be able to scan your poop and tell you what's wrong and make recommendations. Yeah. So, like, that's just one example, right? What about you? Yeah, I'm excited about uh, Alfred North Whitehead is a was a mathematician, and he made the observation that society advances uh, at the rate at which it automates things, and like we we know Moore's law for computation. And so I would call this Whitehead's law of automation. And so if we think about, like, for example, you can walk over to my sink right now and get clean water. Clean water is automated. You and I don't have to walk down to the creek, get water in a bucket, and come back up. And so many things in life are just automated for us. And so what I'm hoping is that we will be able to automate our health. Right now, we have to work very hard. We have to think about what food we eat. We have to... Uh, think about supplements. We have to get measurements all the time. And I think that all could just become invisible, mm-hmm. that we all are in perfect health, or the best we can be, right? and even down to a molecular level. Now, it will take us some time to get there, but I think that looking at the, the system laws of society, the automation of health is inevitability. Like we're just not going to think about it. Mm. It's going to become, and so that's hard to imagine right now because we have to work so hard at it. But yeah. you take very familiar steps. Uh, like you, you look at the things that are automated now, and you just naturally look. Like for example, like our sleep is a good example. Like you go to bed, 
my bed is adjusting its algorithm on hot and yep. cold based upon my sleep profile. Yep. And so like, why wouldn't I also have other things that are automating my yep. sleep performance? Did you get a new pod? Yes. So for, yeah. Th- where like, if you snore, it moves you up and down. Yes. That's so awesome. We had a uh, Mateo on the podcast recently from, from eight sleep. So we're, we're talking about that. Um, he's, he's building some crazy concoctions. Um, okay. So l- let me ask you this. I mean, the future's coming. The, the thing is you built this, this personal brand now too. I have to assume you as an entrepreneur, you're also oppor- opportunistic. You're probably getting good deal flow for a lot of stuff right now. Are you investing in anything? Like any bets you're open to share? I invested in um, Extropic, which is doing uh, compute using thermal dynamics. And I invested in a robotics company building mm-hmm. humanoids. I invest in a new ASIC company that's building um, these chips for uh, large language models. So, a lot of uh, AI stuff. Yep, a lot of yeah. AI stuff. Yeah. So, but I've, I'm really investing most of my money into Blueprint right now. Mm. And that that's purely self-funded right now? Yes. Got it. Okay, so how much, and I asked this question quite a bit, you've had Cody sitting here before, I, I've, I've gotten a sense for how much she's spending on her content team, how much on content in general. If you're comfortable sharing, like, what does your content team look like right now? How much are you spending per month? Mm. I don't know immediately. The team is... Like uh, five, five of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your how much reach are you getting per month right now? Kind of aggregate. Uh, views? Yeah. You know, I don't know that number off the top of my head. I have to assume. I mean, it's got to be in the tens of millions per month. Um, it's right. But it's, it's, it's also hard to track the ROI of this stuff too, because you just, you just never know, right? So yeah, it's yeah, it's very hard to know. Okay, and I want to I'm going to jump back to business in a second, but we we there's a thread about food real quick. What does your current diet look like every day? And then I have another follow up to that. Yeah, it's a diet where every calorie fought for its life for inclusion. So there's not a single calorie in there which does not have a specific objective in my body. And I think before. You tell me if this is still still your same diet. So in the morning, I think there's some ginger, there's some broccoli. Yeah. What else are you eating? Yeah, it's it's uh, vegetable. So yeah, it's vegetables, nuts, berries, seeds, olive oil. Yeah. And basically, yeah. What are, doesn't bore you at all? Does it make you miss like the fat foods? No, I love it. Yeah. I I'm on a caloric restricted diet so i appreciate every calorie i've never appreciated food more in my life mm-hmm. and like i've i've actually tried in the past few months like i had i had a, a roll one time it's just like what would it be like what would it, like what would happen if i ate a roll yeah and i also had i had some sugar what, what did i do yeah i, I experimented with a few things and i i feel sick <laughs> yeah yep. it makes me feel sick and i feel awful so and how many calories are you eating per day right now? Twenty two fifty. Okay, wow, it's very specific. Um, and then you had. Uh, well, let's just rephrase this. Why should people eat chocolate every day? Yeah, I've I've eaten. Uh, what's the number? I've eaten a lot of cocoa over the past three years. Yeah, it's uh, six grams a day. Yeah, it's high in flavanols and a bunch of other goodies. But and this is dark chocolate, right? A hundred percent pure cacao. And I'm I'm a noob to this. Cacao is dark chocolate. Oh, or? just powder, powder. So, okay. Yeah, got it. Yeah, chocolate. So um, when we went through the diet and we said every calorie has to fight for its life, mm-hmm. it it creates um, a set of standards that the food has to be a superfood to begin with, and then it has to be in the exact proportions, and then it's got to be tested for you know heavy metals, etc. And so, coke, uh, cacao hits that threshold of it's a superfood yeah. and six grams is about the right dose. And so we just did a video on this where we went and bought 10 of the most popular supermarket uh, chocolates and we tested them for heavy metals and also flavanols, the good mm-hmm. stuff. So we said, how much bad stuff is in there? How much good stuff is in there? Yeah. And I think the results will terrify you. Can you give us a little preview? Don't, uh, don't share the entire thing, just a little preview. <laughs> well, just that um, 
you it's probably not a good idea to buy chocolate at the grocery store. Yeah. I don't think it's a good idea to buy anything. I don't know if you saw that that uh, research recently about um, I think phosphates and everything, right? Um, and then you have microplastics and everything. Did you see that the tweet yesterday about microplastics entering the testes? Yeah, yeah. So, so what do you? What's your take? Like, how how do you go about um, avoiding all that stuff? Yeah, we. So we we just launched a, a set of food products at Blueprint. We did mm-hmm. supplements and food. Yep, and it has been shocking to learn how dirty the food supply chain is. Mm-hmm. And I guess shocking because like every time you peek into an industry, it's expected you're going to find corruption and like bad behavior. Like that's just, that's humans. Yep. But I assumed that food would have some kind of guardrails around it. There's not. Yep. So when we go to our, to many of these food suppliers, we'd say, okay, if we're going to take your food. We're going to test it for heavy metals. And they're like, what? <laughs> no one has ever asked them to test their food. They have no idea. And so we get back these samples, yep. and they had dangerously level uh, high levels of like lead or mercury or something like that. And we'd be like, what's yep. up? So like, no one's testing. Like, yep. We have had to elbow our way around and test. And we're now setting sights on microplastics. Mm-hmm. So it's, it is a big lift. It is a very complicated process because you're trying to bring food to market, but then you're also having to deal with all the food supply uh, providers already in chain. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's a hard problem to solve. Yep. And so and what's their reaction when you come back to them with that data? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like ignorance is bliss. Mm-hmm. They kind of don't want to know because now you've, you've burdened them uh, by notifying them that they're selling food. Mm-hmm. That is, you know, has like potentially dangerously high levels of of heavy metals. I think a lot of this stuff is going to get exposed. And I think the the marketing genius behind what you're doing is it's going to get exposed anyway. So why not be first? And then you're going to get that reach compounded. That's part of strategy, right? Yeah. I mean, like we're going to be exposed too, right? Like there's just no way that our foods are 100% clean. Like as, as much as we're doing to test, there are so many contaminants to test for. Mm hmm. And by if if we went to certain spec on all contaminants, we probably couldn't bring any food to market, right? Like, I don't know. Like, but we're slowly working our way through. But we have to work through uh, testing providers that can provide us a test. They can do it at a time frame that actually helps. So, like, it's a big lift. It's going to take us time to do it. We're trying to be the best out there in the world, mm-hmm. but like, we're we're not going to be flawless in this. Like, it's going to be a messy process. Hopefully, in time, we'll solve it. Got it. Um, I want to come back to a point you made. Um, I just remember there's there's I think you said at the the longevity summit. Um, are you you're still spending around two million a year on your body, right? Give or take. Uh, I mean that headline. It's like an easy way to summarize it, but oh. no. Okay, <laughs> it's a lot less. Got it. Um, I think the number you say said now is like it's you know if you wanted to go all out, it's probably around one hundred fifty grand a year or so. Uh, I shared today that somebody could achieve similar results to me at forty six dollars a day. Wow. Okay. Great. How how did they do that? Yeah, I just took my power laws, yeah. uh, sleep, diet, exercise. Got it. So that, that. Got yeah. it. And I listed out each thing and the cost. Yeah. So a lot of people they see the two million, and like they then have a certain idea, but it's actually yeah everybody can do this. Got it. Well, not like forty six is affordable by many people. Yeah. Let's say I mean, if you wanted to cut that in half, like twenty dollars a day. Well, thirty five of that is food. Uh huh. Okay. It should be affordable by. A good chunk of people. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, now, coming back to business again. So what are, I mean, you sold Braintree Venmo for around 800 million or so. Is that correct? Yeah. So what are some core lessons you've taken from that journey and, you know, kind of mirrored them over for, for Blueprint? Uh, both, I bootstrapped Blue, uh, Braintree and Blueprint. Hmm, I didn't know that. I thought you, you didn't raise eventually for Braintree? Yeah. In a year five, I did. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, both companies uh, were break even with Blueprint right now. Mm-hmm. So we were break even out of the gate with with uh, Braintree. Mm-hmm. So almost immediate break even for both businesses. Got it. And what does that do for you as a founder psychologically? I mean, it it really comes back to as a founder, what are you building for? Are you building for an exit? 
are you building uh, to take over the world? <laughs> are you building to make a point? Like, there's so many reasons entrepreneurs have to build, mm. and the bootstrapping strategy, uh, I, and also not having external investors, we have a lot of optionality. Whereas when you raise venture capital, you're on a singular path to maximization of profit and either IPO or get acquired. Mm -hmm. And you, you, like if your hands are on the steering wheel, you just can't turn left or right very far. Right. And so I don't want to do that. I don't want to be put on that singular minded path. Mm -hmm. Got it. So you wouldn't want to raise from venture this time. Uh, if we raised, it would be from in, uh, wealthy individuals, like friends of mine, yeah. who are interested in this area. And like they, my my friends know that going back to levels of ambition, start a company, start a country, start a religion. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to build a country and uh, a company and a country and a religion and defy death and all of us become God. Right. That's the goal. So capitalism is such a limiting thing where it says we just care about this money thing. Now, like if money includes other things, cool, but it's it's such a ruthless objective that it eliminates all other possibilities. Mm. And so I'm trying to accomplish the full stack. Now, in in 2100, intelligent ex existence is going to have other aspirations. I'll probably be able to extend past the concept of God. Yeah. But right now, that's peak ambition that can be expressed in this moment. And so this entity and this group is you know, working towards that. Got it. And earlier you said, and you might have just answered the question right here, but earlier you said you can maximize for like you know an exit or you can maximize for, I don't know, fulfillment or something like that. It sounds like you're optimizing for you're just going to build this religion, right? And you're going to work on this for the rest of your life. Like, What is the goal here? Yeah, exactly. The yeah. five levels. Yeah. Right? It's to get all levels of, of human aspiration. Makes sense. Um, one thing I found interesting is you've been going on a tear against uh, a little bit of a tear against uh, AG One. So can you can you explain that? Yeah, they. Anyone who listens to podcast, by the way, do they sponsor your podcast? No. Okay. Yeah. Why haven't you been a sponsor? Had them as a sponsor? Um, I mean, I've used the product. Um, I, I, you know, I have a good friend that works there. Um, but I. I don't know. It's also like mine is a business. I have a business podcast. I have a marketing podcast. So it's not exactly, you know, yeah. health all the time. Okay. So, um, we, most of us want to do positive things for our health. And we have a way of trying to decide how to do those things. Now, if you're anywhere around podcasts, you know that a very large number of podcast people are will advertise the AG1 product and they read the company script, right? They yep. say what the company wants them to say. And so AG1 has paid people who have trust with others. And this is a tactic used long in, in uh, marketing. And it's omnipresent. And if you look at the AG1 product, they have around 70 ingredients, 46 of which you have no idea the dose you're taking. Mm. On the ingredients that they are disclosing, they skim, which means they're far below clinical grade doses. And so what you're getting is basically a green salad, if that. Yeah. But the fact that they're not telling you what you're putting into your body is insane. Like, where else would that be okay? And so it's the entire structure that this company is spending tens of millions of dollars to pay people to read their script. Yeah, These people will read the script happily because they're getting paid an enormous amount of money. I think you said 40 million a year yeah. on podcasts. Yeah, and so it's, I think it's a... a pretty nice encapsulation of the challenges uh, in society that well-meaning people are trying to decide what to do for their wellness. And even like, so wait, let me say this differently. 
we're all trying to dodge the dangers of society. We're trying to avoid microplastics. We're trying to avoid like the bad stuff about junk food. We're trying to avoid addictive algorithms. We're trying to avoid like all these stuff. So who's got our back? And so if a company's pulling it to say, I'm going to give you something that's actually good for you, surely they must have our back. Mm. Actually, no. And so I'm trying to call attention to like the whole situation is just not good for anyone. Got it. I, I like this angle. I, I like this angle where you're like you're calling people out, right, on potentially like questionable practices. I like where you're calling out studies, and I, that's in my opinion, that's a great way to market because you're showing hard data at the end of the day, yeah. right? Um, how else are you going to be evolving the? Because you've been, you know, you built your YouTube up to about a million subscribers. Now you're going to get that gold plaque soon, right? Um, what else are you doing? That's what are some interesting things you're doing with content slash marketing um, that you're comfortable sharing yeah, we're getting better every week the the last few videos we've shot i've just messed around i've been pretty silly did a reaction video with dana white i saw that one. Oh, uh, yeah that was pretty straightforward yeah yeah, yeah. um i guess it, it's it's becoming a, like a lot of play for me where i'm having fun we have an audience we have a community and so it just feels more relaxed. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of celebrities have become interested recently. It, it's crossed a threshold where, for some reason, a lot of celebrities are leaning in. So I think we'll probably do more of that. Yeah. It just feels like it's it's compounding. We're, we're going to probably put together like a, a multi-state "Don't Die" tour. Mm. We'll probably do some uh, "Don't Die" raves. <laughs> uh, we'll probably put together like a don't die uh summit yeah where we'll invite some heads of state to see if we can get them to come yeah but i'm i'm trying to i'm playing for don't die to become the global operating system right i love I'm, th that to me religion is an operating system and so i think yeah both both playing well together yeah um final thing from my side i, I can go on and on but i one thing that's interesting to me is I'm looking at your your books over there. Don't die. Um, so I, I I have the physical copy, but you also you gave away the audio copy mm -hmm. uh, for free. I think I think it's just sitting on YouTube, and I think it's gotten a good chunk of views. What was the thinking behind just giving the audiobook version for free? Yeah, I mean the most expensive thing you can do is make money. Mm, explain. If you. Uh, need to think carefully about the game you're playing and the assumptions behind that game. And we saw this in the beginning with uh, like software where the freemium model came up where mm -hmm. you gave, you know, like some people abused it where like you are the product. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. That didn't work out very well. Yeah. But some companies actually, like I think Dropbox did this well where I forget the stats. It was something like 1% of their users paid. Mm -hmm. And it was more than enough to make the company profitable and grow. And so you could give away 99%. Right. And so it, it works in business. It also works in creating community. Like if you're, if you're trying to bring everyone in and like I, uh, I'm genuinely playing for the future of intelligent existence. That's the only game I care about. Right. I don't care about money. I don't care about anything else. And so yeah. getting the book out to the most people it was really my objective. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense, and this is a great place to to end because, like, you know, building content. A lot of people want to put the content behind a paywall, and you're you're trading the the long term gain for short term. Yeah, but you're just all long term because one, you know, you have your nut already. But the, the other piece is like it. It feels like you're you're relaxed with this. It feels like Braintree Venmo was a lot more stressful. Yeah. Would you say true? Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, Brian, this has been great. What's the best way for for people to find you online? I'm on all social channels, so wherever you're at. All right. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks. Thanks.